Good evening. It's Tuesday night. It's 8 o'clock, and uh, this is the Bob Leonard Show. We'll be with you for about an hour, and like we tell you every week, we take the stories you've been watching on television and reading about in the newspaper, and we put our spin on it. We tell you what's really behind those stories. And like we tell you every week, it's only our opinion, and you can accept or reject it, but obviously we'll have our say. Now, if you missed this program on Tuesday night, uh, tonight, like at 8 o'clock, it will be repeated tomorrow night at uh, 11 to 12 on Channel 17. And if you miss Tuesday night and Wednesday night, you can pick it up again also on your computer by punching in flinttalk.com. And this program uh, tonight and programs for five or six weeks in the past are also uh, available if you uh, want to watch any particular program that you may have missed in the past. So anyway, if you want to see it, it's there. We have uh, a number of things we want to talk about tonight. Uh, the first thing, obviously, uh, I'm sure you've been reading about it in the newspaper and watch it on television, is this Julius Anthony, you remember him, he was uh, hired by Walter Milton, the school superintendent of Flint, who left here a while back and went to uh, some place in Illinois. He hired this fellow Anthony, who was his buddy, and uh, had worked, uh, was a partner with him in business, and uh, hired him to, like the second in command in the Flint school system. But anyway, he now, uh, he goes to uh, Georgia and had his misdemeanor on this charge of assaulting a, a three-year-old child set aside. And uh, now he faces, uh, according to this, Anthony being retried in Georgia. And this was in Wednesday's paper. And uh, here we have Saturday's results. It says, Atlanta jury finds ex-school official guilty of child molestation. Now he's guilty of the felony. He's guilty of a sexual assault on a three-year-old boy in 1996. Like I said, the Georgia court records indicate Anthony had pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor sexual assault, char assault charge in 2002 regarding this case. At that time, he was sentenced to probation and, and whatever. Obviously, in my opinion, that was not a good disposition, especially when a person clearly indicates uh, that he's a pedophile. And he's teaching children. Now, he later claimed he had not pleaded guilty, as the records indicate. Apparently, in Georgia, an attorney can plead guilty in a misdemeanor case on behalf of his client if he has permission from the client. Anthony's attorney made such a plea on behalf of Anthony. Now six years later, in 2006, after he was hired by his friend, as I say, Milton, uh, Walter Milton, as the second in command of Flint Schools, the sexual conviction entered in 2000 and Georgia became public. At this time, Anthony denied he knew his attorney pleaded guilty for him or that he had authorized it. And also, when the, when the 2000 conviction became public, locally, Anthony was charged with failure to register as a sex offender in Michigan as in violation of Michigan law. Subsequently, when this case was dismissed in Georgia, uh, Leighton dismissed that charge here. Now, after this disclosure was made and after he was exposed as a pedophile, he immediately quit his job and left the state. Now, after Anthony's highly questionable claim of denying he had knowledge that his attorney had pleaded guilty for him in 2000, a Georgia judge dismissed the case. Now, immediately thereafter, 
the Atlantic District Attorney reinstated the felony charges that had been dismissed in a plea bargaining agreement in Georgia when Anthony was supposed to have pleaded to the misdemeanor. Now this case has culminated in this felony conviction that I mentioned to you by a jury this past Thursday. Now here's uh, Channel 12's report on, on this conviction. Can you play that please? Administrator Julius Anthony, a district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, says Anthony has been convicted of molesting a three-year-old boy in 1996. Officials say the boy was in his care in a Head Start program that he oversaw. The boy, who is now 15, testified in the trial and said he did not remember the incident. Anthony now faces five to 20 years in jail. He was charged in Genesee County with failure to register as a sex offender when he came to work in Flint. Those charges were eventually dropped when Anthony's original conviction was set aside. Nobody now, you know, we told you numerous times on this program that we never believed that Anthony did not know about his attorney's action. Or did we believe that he didn't authorize it? You know, after six years, it seems to me he would have had a clue that his case did not just go away, particularly after he had taken and flunked the lie detector test about assault, assaulting this child. You know, he had to realize that something happened to this original felony charge, especially after he took uh, the uh, lie detector test to de determine his guilt or innocence, and it indicated his culpability. Did he think that everybody just walk away after all that effort was made? You know, in my opinion, Anthony and his attorney friends <clears throat> thought they could run a loose on the criminal justice system, and he could walk away free with no record and return to teaching as a, as a pedophile. You know, fortunately for the district, district attorney from Atlanta, he recognized Anthony's threat to young people and, and went after him. You know, you have to keep in mind, whatever Anthony said, you have to recognize that this is the guy that lied in his application when applying for the Flint School job. Remember, he, he offered bold-faced lies about his job experience which was required to get the job. He never had the experience. And the newspapers in St. Louis made that determination. He said he had a college degree, a master's degree, which he did not have, which was required for the job. And, and you know, this went on, and, and there was a lot of you and cry and, and support for Anthony after this case was dismissed. Even though, there, you know, clearly his defense to this thing was, was just not reasonable. That he didn't know about it for six years? Come on. But anyway, he had some support. Some of the people thought uh, when he was brought into court in chains that uh, it was uh, not fair. How do you be fair to a pedophile? You know, what's bothersome is the effect of some of the politicians locally wanting to fix blame for Anthony's predicament on others who are trying to protect their children. Well, anyway, we have this situation where he's brought in the court and there was some consternation because of he was brought in a belly chains and things like that. See, what people don't realize here is this wouldn't have happened if Anthony and his attorney didn't try to beat the system. There was an agreement when the uh, warrant was issued in Michigan for his uh, refusal to register as a sex offender. A warrant was issued for him. His attorney contacted the sheriff 
and the prosecutor and said, look, if we surrender, we'd like to avoid being arrested. We'd like to surrender and go get our uh, court date set. And the prosecutor and the sheriff said, fine. The agreement was that Anthony's attorney would meet with the sheriff at his office so that he could be fingerprinted and mugshot, which the law requires. And he agreed to that. And if he had done that, the sheriff, uh, like he does with all other cases of, of similar uh, involvement, would have allowed him to go back with his attorney to the courtroom where the, sheriff, the prosecutor would send one of his attorneys in and a court date would be set and he could have left. But what he did is he didn't show up at the sheriff's department. The attorney ran directly to the court and got a judge to agree to process his case without going to the sheriff's department, which is required by law. And he would have gotten away with it and walked away with no publicity. He was trying to beat the publicity. He was trying to beat the mugshot and the fingerprints. And he would have gotten away, as I say, with it if there was a sheriff's deputy there who saw him, recognized him, knew he was supposed to go to the jail, called the uh, sheriff up, and they arrested him and brought him into the county jail the hard way. And it was his doing and his attorney's doing by not keeping the agreement. And they never, in my opinion, knowing how uh, Anthony uh, works, they, he never planned on keeping the agreement. This was just a, a ruse to try to prevent him from being fingerprinted and mugged and the press being around. So with all that in mind, when you bring a guy into jail, the procedure of the prosecutor or the sheriff is he goes in and cuffs and, and, uh, and stomach chains. So he did nothing unusual with Anthony. He didn't do it because he was African American. He did it because he violated the agreement. And he had to bring him in jail, bring him uh, into court in chains. That's the procedure. So they did nothing unusual in this case. But you wouldn't know that from some of the apologists for Anthony. Some of them sitting on the city council. More concerned about whether this fellow was brought in chains or whether he kept his agreement than the protection of the kids. Now, I wonder, uh, considering the happenings of the last week with Anthony's fel felony conviction, if these naysayers will now acknowledge that the sheriff and the, and the prosecutor it was clearly fair in handling Anthony. And he, they were justified. Especially when you realize that Anthony violated the agreement he made with the sheriff. The sheriff would have, uh, if he d did what he promised to do, the sheriff would have mugshot him, fingerprinted him, said to his attorney, take your client and we'll see you in court in a half hour. Hour, whatever the case may be. And they would have walked out. No chains, no handcuffs. But don't blame the sheriff for it. Anthony broke his agreement and never showed up. And he would have walked away without any of these things if the sheriff deputy didn't see him down there in the court. You know, actually, uh, Anthony and his friends, in light of last week's verdict, obviously outfox themselves. Now Anthony is now facing 20 years in prison instead of just a sexual assault record. Now I think that that's fairer than what they did 10 years ago or 7 years ago in letting him plead to a misdemeanor. This guy's a pedophile. He deals with children. He's a teacher. You've got to get this guy away from kids. And you know, uh, Milton, you know, and, and the ultimate verdict, in my opinion, is just justice playing out here. And you, can, you know, Milton, uh, uh, Walter Milton, the superintendent, should not escape uh, uh, responsibility here. He, you know, he, he's known this guy for years. He's, he's been his partner. 
I personally think that he knew about this history and tried to slip it by the board. But anyway, even if he didn't, he had the obligation, this fellow coming in here, the law requires to, that he be checked out. He was never checked out. Milton, all he had to do was pick up the phone and call. And he would have found out that the individual had a record. And he shouldn't be exposed to children. I don't think Milton really cared. This was his buddy, his business partner in the past. The guy that was with him all, you know, for the last eight, ten years. They lived together. Well, whatever the case is, uh, we think uh, on this program that the verdict is more than justified. And the result of that verdict hopefully will take this fellow off the streets, which will give a, a greater guarantee to our children that they are safe. Well, let's go on here. I, here's a, you know, there's, it's election time. So let's now look at one of the high-profile mayoral uh, elections to be held in November in this county, in Genesee County. This week, uh, we, we'd like to talk a little about the Burton election, where the highly controversial Charles Smiley will be uh, running uh, for his fourth four-year term for the Burton mayor. He's been in there 16 years now. Now, Smiley's administration, as I'm sure you all know, has, uh, has been identified as corrupt. So especially with the conviction of Smiley's closest aide, Public Works Director Charles Abbey, for extortion. And, uh, and then the conviction of his close friend, Blake Rizzo, for bribery. You know, while Smiley loudly and bombastically proclaims his innocence of any wrongdoing, even though he has been accused uh, uh, of taking bribes by an FBI informant who testified to it under oath on, on many occasions, he, he claims he gave Smiley bribes. But not only that, Smiley has admitted taking cash payments hidden in an envelope delivered by a secretary to Smiley, delivered to him while he was standing on a street corner. And the money came from the same informant. He admits he got that money from him. You know, Smiley's many benefactors and, and campaign con uh, contributors from such generosity, besides Rizzo, has often been other land developers and other vendors, big campaign contributors, and they were doing business with the city. You know, in a recent interview with uh, Channel 66 after the August primary, Smiley tried to establish his innocence by arguing that he must have been cleared by the feds since no federal official has ever talked to him about the case or the allegations made against him for taking bribes. Can you play that tape, please? ...surrounding his time in office. You have never been charged, but uh, your name has definitely come up in several controversies surrounding other officials within the Burton City government, including taking bribes from developer Blake Rizzo. Uh, what, do, what, what can you tell, I guess, your voters tonight to assure that no controversy will surround you in the next term should you be voted in? All I can do is assure you that I've never been talked to from anybody whatsoever, from the prosecutors, from detectives, to anybody other than certain members of the media that talk to me. Mayor Smiley, you beat your opponent by about a 2-1 to one margin back in 2003. But based on last night's numbers, the November election could be pretty close. Uh, will being the incumbent give you somewhat of an edge? But you have been involved in controversy. Well, you know, this, this election is not about any controversy at all. It's about promoting the city of Burton. It's about creating jobs and opportunities. It's about building a stronger community. It's about being involved in this community. And Mayor Smiley says he plans to stay involved with the community throughout his campaign. Well, 
says he's never been prosecuted and he, he's never been charged. And uh, He said in the past he's never been interviewed uh, by the feds. You know, his conclusion that he would have been talked to by now if he wasn't cleared, already cleared. Actually, the opposite is true. We know this investigation is still going strong, and if Smiley was cleared by the FBI, they'd be just looking at him as a witness. Don't you think the feds would have already called him in as a witness? I'm, I'm sure they would have if that was the case. They want to hear what, I would think, they want to hear what he had to say about the allegations made against him and his administration. You know, their top informant, the FBI's top informant, who they obviously believe or would have charged him with other crimes themselves and said they would if he was lying, they've never charged him. In three years he's been working with them. And they check these things out, what he tells them. So obviously they're checking out. If Smiley, this guy is alleged that he gave bribes to Smiley. Now the feds obviously believe him. If they weren't, if they didn't believe him, they'd call him in as a witness, uh, Smiley as a witness to say, what's going on here? The truth of it is, and I'm sure his lawyers have told him that, this, that these facts... that they haven't really, that the feds haven't really talked to him about anything, indicate clearly he's still the target and not a witness. Which really means to me is they still suspect him of being a party to the wrongdoing that really has paralyzed Burton politics for the last four years. You know, this fact that he hasn't been called in is usually not a good omen for a suspect. They don't usually call a target in to question him before a grand jury or even with the FBI until, until they're ready to proceed against him. And they bring him in to testify before the FBI or under oath in the grand jury and they, uh, he ends up uh, trying to defend himself by lying, and then they charge him with perjury. Here, let me, right after this case, the Flint Journal wrote an editorial. And keep in mind, the Flint Journal has always supported Smiley when he's run for election, except this last time where they endorsed Laurie Tennant. But here's, here's, an editorial that I think tells a story about this Smiley administration. It says, corrupt climate. Burton Mayor Smiley allowed atmosphere, atmosphere for wrongdoing. Then it goes on to say, even before Burton Mayor Charles Smiley's friend and aide was convicted last week of bribery and extortion, trial testimony in the mayor's own statements had shown this administration guilty of gross impropriety. Can there be any reasonable doubt that the developer Blake Rizzo, who profited immensely from business dealings with the city, with the city should, not have bought, should not have bought plane tickets to Florida and Las Vegas for Smiley and Florida tickets for Public Works Director Charles Abbey? And then there is the bizarre scene described in federal court testimony of Smiley waiting on a street corner to accept an envelope of cash from Rizzo's secretary. It was part of a bail money, according to Rizzo, according to what Smiley told Rizzo, was part of bail money to spring one of the mayor's relatives from jail. Rizzo's secretary never should have been able to give such damning evidence because the mayor should have had the ethics and good sense not to solicit a financial favor from someone 
so dependent on the city's goodwill. While the aforementioned creates an undeniable error of corruption at Burton City Hall, Abby's conviction and possible prison sentence stems from another transgression. His acceptance of a subdivision lot from Rizzo for free or greatly reduced price allegedly for favorable city treatment. The journal goes on to say in their editorial, Smiley at very least owes his constituents an apology for permitting a climate in which public roles and personal gain become intertwined. He can begin this con contrition by ending his absurd claim that he's done nothing wrong. Absurd claim. It is absurd. And it goes on and says, based on Abby's conviction and other acknowledged entanglements involving Rizzo, Smiley, at Smiley's administration is not the model to be followed. And these, you know, keep in mind the Flint Journal was always the apologist for this guy. Always, you know, saying, well, he's a good guy. And now they realize what Laurie Tennant's been saying for years, he's corrupt. Oh, is this the kind of guy you want to reelect as mayor when even his greatest supporter in the past comes out and says he is corrupt? Well, anyway, as I said, since that time, since they wrote this article, the journal has endorsed Lori Tennant for mayor and criticized Smiley's involvement, uh, as they did in this editorial, also in the endorsement they gave Tennant, saying she'd be the much better choice. We'll talk more about that later on. But anyway, he comes up and uh, for re-election in November. I hope that people read this information and, and conclude, as the journal did, and uh, a majority of the people who voted in, in uh, the primary a couple of weeks ago, a majority of them decided they were not going to vote for Smiley. They had, the opponents of Smiley got 58% of the vote. Smiley got 42%. We'll see what happens in the general election. We'll see what happens with those votes that went to Smiley's opponents who were not nominated, like Lori Tennant. See where those votes go. Anyway, here's another issue. We talked about this for some time now, for a month, two months. The career alliance fiasco gets more insane every day. There's no question, there's plenty of responsibility from for wrongdoing to go around. You know, from the staff excesses in salaries, uh, uh, you know, travel, uh, first class travel, abuse of credit cards, and you know, outright thievery. The executive director giving herself, her friends, and her family special preferred treatment. You know, and, and then the, then the, uh, board people to sleep at the switch board of directors, some who have benefited directly from their special status on the board with Career Alliance. You know, all these things just continue to pile up. You know, this is also known as conflict of interest, which the board denies, even though some of the organization they represent has received money from Career Alliance. That's ridiculous. It has to be a conflict. You know, keep in mind that this board is dotted with some of the most influential citizens of our community. You know, in the past, they've always been running interference for this career alliance, protecting them, making sure that, uh, you know, the wrongdoing isn't exposed. You know, the, the, re, the re, most recent exposure of wrongdoing really caught this, uh, this uh, structure, board of directors, completely by surprise. You know, they've been just floating along, letting the, 
the staff people, uh, Pam Loving and her friends uh, run this whole organization. They weren't overseeing it like they were supposed to. And, and you know, you have to recognize the, the one person more than anybody else who exposed and uh, caused these revelations of this ripoff, you know, of those most in need of this kind of a program, the unemployed, the underemployed, and of course the taxpayers. The guy that really exposed this was Ron Funger, the investigative reporter at the Flint Journal. He was the first to tell the public that their money is being misused with this organization. You know, his constant barrage of stories which revealed Queer Alliance mismanagement and corruption was too much for the, the usual apologists, you know, the board of directors people who protected the, the uh, staff people and, and the questionable actions they were taking. You know, since the, since the board, according to Fonger, was part of the problem, which he documented, conflicts of interest and, and uh, travel and what have you, the board members were quickly put on the defensive because of Fonger's story. So now they're a little concerned about what they can do. They can't do what they did in the past and try to cover this up because Fonger must have written 20 stories on this. And there's a hue and cry, there's a, a rumble outside in the public's mind that something's wrong here. You know, when Fonger started out, he had the support of, uh, when he started his investigation, he had the support from the professional bureaucrats who are kind of the civil servants and they're not engaged in politics. The professionals who have had, you know, they've had their eye on Career Alliance here in Flint for some time as an organization that was becoming incapacitated and functioning primarily for the staff people's own self-interest. Fonger stories began to expose not only ineptitude, but criminal wrongdoing. Actually, the, the, the fire, because of this, became too hot for the regular board members to handle. Enter the state and local Democratic Party to the rescue. Now, immediately, evasive action was taken from the top of the state labor department with the politicians. They oversee all these local career alliance type agencies in 27 different states. In Flint, we get about $21 million a year of your tax money. See, the bureaucrats here observed that th there was all kinds of things, wrongdoings going on with the local career alliance. And they also recognize that this is, this is a problem on the other 26 career ally, uh, alliance uh, type agencies in the state. All with boards of directors with powerful people from their local agencies. So that's a tough bunch to, to crack. You, I mean, these people, they don't want anything bad being said about their agency because it reflects on them so they're going to do everything they can to protect it because they don't want to be known as people who are engaged with an agency that's corrupt even if it is corrupt and that's the problem we have here now the, the Democrats come in now the state Democrats come in and the first thing they do to try to stop the bleeding is they take these investigators from the, the bureaucrats, the professionals, the civil servants who found all this wrongdoing, took it away from them, the investigation, turned it over to the politicians. The second step was kind of the poo-poo Fonger's revelations. 
Now the pros weren't doing that. They were helping him. They wanted something done. They knew there was wrongdoing. Now, the latest thing is, they've announced that the State Labor Department and Career Alliance have reached an agreement that Career Alliance would not do these bad things in the future. That's obviously an attempt to say, oh, we got it settled. The public can forget about it. We got it under control. And the way they do it, the vehicle they use is, we won't do it again. Like I said last week, I'm sure a bank robber would like that same opportunity. And what about the wasted and the stolen taxpayers' dollars disclosed by Fonger and this program over the last three, four, five, six months? It's completely ignored. And it would have been ignored. And they would have gotten away with it. But a problem developed, the fly in the ointment, as we call it. This is when the state in Fonger is really kind of putting pressure not only on the board of directors, but on the county commission who appoint most of these people. And the county chairman is Archie Bailey, and he's really nervous because Fonger's going to him and talking to him about it. So to protect his backside, he makes a criminal complaint to the sheriff's department about the very questionable transaction for a new phone system for Career Alliance. Remember I told you about this last week where this guy walks in off the street, nobody knows him, supposedly, goes to Pam Loving and says, hey, I'll come in here and look at your phone system, and if you have a problem, I'll tell you what the problem is, and I won't charge you anything. I'll do it as a free of charge. Now, uh, Pam Loving says, yeah, okay, go ahead. Hey, there was no complaints about the phone system in the first place. The people who work for Career Alliance up there and use the phone system said it worked fine. All of a sudden, this guy's there looking at it. It was really kind of strange, strange. So this fellow does this supposedly investigation of their phone system and says, hey, you've got some problems here. There's a new phone system that a fellow in uh, a company in Lansing uses that I think would be very helpful for this organization and would help your phone system, which apparently there was nothing wrong with in the first place. But Pam Loving said, okay, we'll do that. Here's $117,000 for the contract to the company whom he recommended. Well, as it turns out, these bureaucrats, these professionals, these civil service people who are not politicians thought something was wrong with this thing, especially when they talked to the people up there who said there was nothing wrong with the, the system. So they followed through and investigated the company. They went beyond and got their records and looked at who provided them the equipment that they would put in to the front system for $117,000. Guess what? It turns out to be this guy who kind of walked in off the streets, nobody really knew, and made the recommendation to this company. So while he didn't get money for making the recommendation for a new system, which they didn't need, he got it on the other end where he sold them the equipment that they used in Flint. Oh, oh, one other thing. The guy that just came in out of the blue said he'd do this for nothing, that made money on the other end, is Pam's Loving's son by another marriage where the name is different. And these bureaucrats found that out too. That's a crime. That's an obtaining money under false pretenses. No phone system was needed. And this thing was all covered up. This was the classic example of avoiding a paper trail. Because the paper trail would have went back to the company. And if this son couldn't have been tied to that company providing the equipment, 
and they would have got away with it. That's what the Democrats in the state level and the Democrats at the local level are doing. Now here comes the state. It says, man, what's this Bailey doing? He's really screwed up our plan. They couldn't call off the wolves like they did in the Labor Department where they control the bureaucrats and shift them off to some other job. Keep in mind that the people at the top in the Labor Department are all appointed by the governor or whomever up there at the state level on the recommendation, you know, of the Democratic Party because these are Democrats. And they're the ones trying to make these changes, trying to prevent this thing from blowing up. Because the people who run Career Alliance are pretty much all Democrats themselves, have been identified as Democrats. So what do they do on a local level? How do they put a cap on this on a local level? Enter, enter State Senator John Gleason. He contacts the Genesee County Sheriff's Department Bob Pacal, uh, and you know, they obviously know each other. I don't know if they're good friends, but they know each other. And he begins to apparently tell Pacal, and this doesn't come from Pacal, it comes from another person that we found this out from, but he apparently tells Pacal, hey, uh, this is a, a, a bold thing. There's nothing to this thing. All these good people on this board of directors, we don't want to, uh, you know, ruin their names or give the impression they don't know what they're doing so you know why don't you get rid of this case get rid of it of course Piquel told them no he's not going to do it uh, and he's continued the investigation but there'll be more pressure there's going to be more pressure on these people but the point is with John Gleason the goal of this guy to do this because what he's done is he, this clearly could be an obstruction of justice. This, this obstruction is a 10-year felony. What is he sticking his face into a criminal investigation, trying to interfere with it, trying to stop it? You know, on such a solicitation, by Gleason was apparently made. Um, actually, it was, in my opinion, it was made to the wrong guy because uh, he'll just pursue it that much harder, in my opinion. You know, if somebody asked him, uh, you know, like if feds got involved, the feds are involved. They're doing an investigation too. If they start subpoenaing people on this, um, uh, some of them will tell the truth without any question what went on here and if they did I would sus I would uh, suspect that Mr. Uh, you know Senator Gleason would be uh, in a serious amount of trouble if they did this and it turns out that he did try to influence the direction of a criminal investigation You know, these people just should stay out of this and let the investigation take its own course and let the chips fall where they may and on anyone who's in the way. And keep in mind, this thing, this thing of the interference with the investigation on a state and local level may not go away. They'll continue to try to figure ways to beat this system, to beat this investigation. And you know, it's you know, Fonger's done all he's can. Now it's up to the public to indicate to these elected officials they're not going to stand for this. To get out of the way and keep your opinions to yourself. Now this is, you know, we've had some success where the public has been infuriated by politicians actions and they themselves have taken action you know here's an example of what I'm talking about an example of public outrage over the 
actions of local politicians that cause these politicians to change their tune and reverse their actions on an issue that if left unchallenged would have been adversely impacted our citizens quality of life remember the, the confrontation we showed you on this program last week and the week before between uh, Councilman Scott Kincaid and his other four people. Keep in mind there's five anti uh, Williamson people up there do anything to try to create problems with him and help his opponent. Well anyway there was a confrontation we showed you between Kincaid and Public Works Director uh, Bill Ayers to talk about resolutions regarding the acceptance of money from the federal state government and private sources. Millions of dollars. And because Williamson had made the proposal just before the election, these five council people thought it might be helpful to Williamson in his election if they approved this. So they turned it down. And the threat is you could lose it if you don't act on it, if they don't approve the resolutions within a certain date or before a certain date. You know, whether this would have helped his election or wouldn't have helped it is really kind of unimportant because the bottom line was not Williamson's election but the well-being of the public. These grants that I talk about that they turned down or was the money we are we already paid in state and federal taxes they want to give back to us we're entitled I refer to it as free money because we don't have to add any matching money to speak of from the city's general fund In this confrontation between Kincaid and Ayers, you'll hear Ayers warn the council that if these resolutions to accept this money, to demolish houses, to fix streets, to fix the Third Avenue corridor between U of M and Flint and the Kettering, all the, you know, and, and specific other projects, and I'll get into those in a minute, the state and federal government, if they, if, we, if they can't get us to accept it, and it's up to the council. Williams made the proposal. The council turned it down. This, they, you know, Air says they'll give the money to another community in another part of Michigan. Here's the exchange that I'm talking about, uh, some of it uh, that occurred between uh, Kincaid and Ayers uh, on this subject. Can you play that, please? Discussion. Hello. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? <coughs> uh, 070717. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. on time purposes, I think we're going to move to postpone the entire uh, the remaining of the agenda for two weeks. Okay. Mr. Second. Okay. Chief, is there anything you want to? If you want any streets paved, I hope you pull out 70718. If we get a budget, we might be able to pave some streets. In addition, I would ask when we find the number for the submission for our, our grants for our transportation improvement program that isn't spending any money right now and that is 70767 generally there's a timeliness issue on these and if we do not submit some other community would be happy to spend this money
this is federal aid uh, money, and then there's also uh, jobs today money involved that basically makes it free except for preliminary engineering. And I would certainly request that you approve that. And Mr. Ayer, this is something we did last year as well, right? We do it every year. Or the jobs but today. the Jobs Today program, it was a, a new program last year. And we have taken full advantage of it, probably more so than any other community in the state. Okay, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. just a just, uh, point of clarification. If we postpone something, it comes back in two weeks, right? That's right. Thank if you. we, if we if we move it and it doesn't pass, it can't come back for 30 days. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Well, that, that was a little bit. And here's Bill Ayers telling him, hey, if you don't approve this, we're going to lose this money. And um, he went up there and uh, made the presentation, and they turned it down. They didn't grant it. Now, the heat that was caused by this tape we showed you here, we did about 12 or 13 minutes of it uh, here on another program, caused great anger and frustration on part of the public who saw this. And they went to their council people and said, you better approve this thing. If you don't, you're going to hear from us in more ways than just waiting until next election. Some of these people got uh, very frightened because of this, and the result was this. Can you play that? Um, if, if you approve that, we'll have a, a contract shortly with MDOT regarding that, and uh, much, most of that work could get done this fall, but not all of it will be done uh, because it's, it's getting late in the year. So some of it we'll have to come back and, and, and finish that. Thank you very much. That's all predicated on this grant, right? That's predicated on this grant. Now, if, um, please understand, we have received two grants on this project, which are the matching amount for the entire grant. The enhancement grant is two and a half million dollars. We've met with all the neighborhoods uh, been several times. The land bank's been involved, carries down. Uh, people from Hurley Hospital, Durant, Turley Mott, Atwood Stadium, the neighborhood group basically has planned this program. Uh, my office applied for the enhancement grant. We then, with the help of these groups, got a matching grant for the, to pay the matching funds. We got a 200 and some thousand dollar grant from the Ruth Mott Foundation and the balance from the Mott Foundation. So that entire enhancement grant of two and a half million dollars has not crossed the city one cent. And, and that's why we need to accept these and get this thing done. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those? 070905. There you are. This group, these five, stopped it here about four weeks ago. It was actually a month ago. Even after Ayers told them that if you keep that up, we're going to lose these grants. Here's, here's what he said in a letter, a memo he sent to them, verifying what he said. Please be advised that it, uh, and this is uh, August 6th, and this took place, I think, uh, August 7th, 8th, or whatever. Please be advised it is imperative that the city take immediate action to adopt several resolutions previously submitted by the, uh, or to the Flint City Council that requested authorization to enter into contracts with the Michigan Department uh, of Transportation. The contracts outline the rights and obligations of uh, MDOT and the city for numerous road projects proposed to be funded by federal and state funds. The resolution must be adopted or the city will be in jeopardy of losing MDOT funding for these various projects. Went on to say, among other things, in addition, attached is a letter from Roe Incorporated that clearly identifies the city as required to complete all contract documents for the road projects program with MDOT by August 17, 2007. 
If the city misses the deadline, the funding from MDOT will be lost and any previous funding re awarded to these projects will be required to re be repaid in full. Here we are. We just get it. All I got to do is approve the resolutions, but because it's Williamson's recommendation, they're not going to approve it. Listen to this. We're talking about, uh, here's the projects. Uh, Horton Avenue, curb and gutter and sidewalk work from Horton Avenue to York and Carpenter Roads along Selby Streets and Laredo Avenue. Uh, north to Pearson Road. Contract such and such preliminary engineering uh, for reconstruction along Webster Road and Dort Highway to Carpenter Road. Contract preliminary engineering reconstruction along Saginaw Street from Austin Avenue to Carpenter Road. We won't get the money if they don't approve it. Finally, finally they did approve it at the end when they knew the public was coming down on them. And they came down hard on them. That the, at, the, at the, these block clubs, at the, the uh, police, uh, many stations, people were outraged when they saw this. And what I'm pointing out is it made a difference because they changed, these five changed their votes and supported this. All this money. We're talking, this is just for, uh, this was just for uh, streets. Over $10 million we're talking about that we would have lost. $10 million for these projects. The people living on those streets are going to call up and raise hell with those council people. They would, they would have had still holes in their streets that the, the uh, public works department is trying to, fi uh, trying to uh, fix up. So it does help. It does help to complain. So hopefully, you see, when the public gets its its um, anger up and communicates their discontent to the politicians, good things can happen. This happened on this commission. They all voted unanimously. Well, a, a month before, these five people voted against it and said they're not going to vote for it, except for the heat that came down on them for it. You can do that with Career Alliance. Let's cause something to change there. Don't let the Democrats or, or the politicians, whoever they are, and I'm a Democrat. I hate to tell you this, but I'm a, uh, the Democrats are behind this. Don't let them do this to us. If people are stealing, and people are, doing, uh, are committing wrongdoings, let them be prosecuted. Let the chips fall where they may. I'll see you next week. I'll have more information on some of these stories. In the meantime, we'll be at the White Horse.